In the desolate heart of a Canadian shield, the sparsely populated expanse of boreal forest and Precambrian rock that stretches from the highlands of eastern Labrador to the woods of northern Saskatchewan lies Cobalt, Ontario, a remote town of a thousand souls. Born out of an early 20th century silver rush, this isolated enclave of humanity has produced a startling variety of strange stories since its 1906 genesis, which were diligently documented by Canadian writer John Robert Colombo in his 1999 book, Mysteries of Ontario. Foremost among these is the legend of Old Yellow Top, a flaxen-headed wild man said to haunt the surrounding forest. Spotted in 1906, 1926, 1946, and 1970, which we explored in the previous piece. The oldest story Colombo relates is set back in 1896, seven years before the Cobalt Silver Rush. At that time, the region's only human inhabitants were Cree and Ojibwe natives, Hudson's Bay Company employees of the surrounding forts Matachuan, Demiskamingue, and Tamagami, oblate missionaries, seasonal lumberjacks, and a few French-Canadian settlers who had begun to take up residence just east of the Quebec border. Legend has it that one of the new arrivals to the region was a mysterious young French-Canadian artist named Henri Alt, who established a studio in the area. That spring, Alt painted a daytime scene of Christ standing on the shores of the Dead Sea, a painting which some harsher critics might dismiss as relatively unremarkable were it not for an extraordinary metamorphosis it undergoes in the absence of light. Upon entering his studio one night, one version of the legend contends, Alt was astonished to discover that this painting had assumed a miraculous aspect in the dark. The divine subject had transformed into a statue-like silhouette with lifelike three-dimensional attributes, whose robes billowed as if subject to a gentle breeze. The celestial background had taken on a luminous hue as of a sky on a moonlit night. Behind Christ's head was a halo which actually seemed to radiate light which some witnesses have since likened to the soft glow of moonlight. Perhaps most eerily, the dark shadow of a cross appeared plainly and distinctly behind Christ's left shoulder, at a spot where Alt had only painted plain blue sky. This sensational and mysterious work of art, dubbed the Shadow of the Cross, was subsequently displayed at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. In 1910 and 11, it was showcased in the Doré Gallery on London, England's Bond Street alongside the masterpieces of French artist Gustave Doré. Here, it was purportedly examined by British chemist and physicist Sir William Crookes, who could find no evidence of phosphorescent or radioactive paint which might account for its baffling luminous characteristic. The painting eventually made its way to Atlanta, Georgia, where it was purchased by a wealthy Texan named Mrs. Herbert Sidney Griffin. Griffin, in turn, donated the piece to the San Francisco de Assis Mission Church, a historic Spanish colonial church in Rancho de Taos, New Mexico, where it remains to this day. A third cobalt mystery came to national attention in the twilight of the cobalt silver rush. In the autumn of 1931, cobalt miners William Forrest, Frank Wilder, and Tom Powers reported that the eerie airs of a stringed instrument issued at night from an abandoned cabin on the shores of Baptiste Lake about 63 miles or 102 kilometers northwest of Cobalt, incidentally near the ruins of the old Hudson's Bay Company's Fort Metatuan. Local natives claimed that this ramshackle hut belonged to a chief who had died there in the early 1920s and who was known to have played the harp in life. Inside the cabin, the miners found a fiddle with broken strings, which the late chief had kept near his bed. Of all the mysteries to come out of this remote corner of civilization, one of the most interesting is that of the aquatic monster said to haunt Lake Temiskaming, a long, narrow body of water which straddles a border between Ontario and Quebec, whose name means Deep Waters, and whose shore lies about four miles or seven kilometers northeast of Cobalt. Referred to as Lac Temiskamingue by the French-speaking residents of its eastern shores, this lower extension of the Ottawa River served as the southernmost stretch of an ancient canoe road connecting James Bay, the southern appendage of Hudson Bay, with the watershed of the Great Lakes. This aquatic highway was first traversed by whites in the spring of 1686, when the wilderness of what is now northern Ontario was populated by the members of two competing fur companies. 
to the north was Rupert's Land, the watershed of Hudson Bay, on the gloomy shores of which the 16-year-old British Hudson's Bay Company, or HBC, built its frozen Palisade fortresses. To the south was the Pays d'Ao, the watershed of the Great Lakes, patrolled by independent French Coureur des Bois and agents of the four-year-old Compagne du Nord. Despite that the British King Charles II and the French monarch Louis XIV at that time were reveling in what historian Francis Parkman Jr. described as a time of profound peace, the French syndicate had waged an aggressive campaign against its British rival since its inception, hoping to stem the flow of furs to the north. After the establishment of a trading post called Fort St. Anne on a now-vanished island in Lake Temiskaming at the mouth of the Montreal River, a company of French marines and French-Canadian militiamen under the command of Captain Pierre de Troyes, Chevalier de Troyes, traveled north up the lake and further north through the bush, launching what historian Peter C. Newman described as one of North America's earliest and most successful commando assaults on the forts of the Hudson's Bay Company. At the time of this so-called Hudson's Bay Expedition, the route between Hudson Bay and the Ottawa River was an uncharted wilderness, in which no portage routes had yet been cut. The trail that de Troyes and company blazed would not be widely used for at least another hundred years, being reopened during the turbulent spell of competition between the HBC and its new arch-rival, the Northwest Company. This grueling brigade route continued to be traversed by HBC voyageurs throughout the 1800s, being one of two trails which connected the Great Lakes with the frozen sea for which the company was named. In 1933, Decades after this primitive trail had fallen out of general use, an old HBC voyageur, who had plied a portion of this path in its waning years, penned what might be the first reference to an ancient belief that Lake Temiskaming is haunted by some mysterious entity. In April 1933, a two-part story appeared in the Haleyburyan, a newspaper based out of the town of Haleybury, Ontario, now part of Temiskaming Shores. The author wrote under the pseudonym Shakonash, a variation of the Algonquian word Sheganash, which means white man. The story, entitled A Canoe Trip to Fort Temiskamingue in 79, appears to be a true account of a routine HBC round trip from Fort Metachuan to Fort Temiskamingue, the latter lying on the eastern shores of the narrowest part of the lake, just south of present-day Ville-Marie, Quebec. This piece offers rare insight into the culture of the HBC in Northern Ontario in the late 1800s, and into the daily minutiae which attended the life of a late 19th century voyageur. After chronicling the canoe trip down the Montreal River, the author described his party's entrance into Lake Temiskaming. When we came down to the big steep rocks on the west side, he wrote, the Indian crews had a great talk in their own language, and everyone who used tobacco put a little in the water in front of the steep rocks the writer adding his quote with the rest. I never learned the real significance of the performance, but anyone who passed on the lake with a loaded canoe in front of those rocks will know that it was very advisable to court the favor of the water sprite. The water sprite, supposed to haunt these steep cliffs fronting the southwestern shores of Lake Temiskaming, a vista which French-Canadian bishop Monsignor Narcisse Zephyrine Lorraine likened to the famous fjord-like slopes of Quebec's Saguenay River, was almost certainly a specimen of what local natives called the Memaguese, the subject of a strange native legend shared by First Nations across the continent. These mystical figures were described as hairy dwarves or long-haired sirens, their descriptions varying slightly from tribe to tribe. They were universally supposed to be endowed with preternatural power, particularly the ability to conjure storms and strong winds, and were said to inhabit the rocky cliffs which fringe lakes and rivers. From the Mi'kmaq of New Brunswick to the interior Salish of British Columbia, native peoples the country over offered gifts of tobacco to these mysterious beings in order to ensure their safe passage through their waters. Such concerns were not unwarranted on Lake Temiskaming, where poor weather can have deadly consequences. For example, on June 13, 1978, 13 young canoeists from Claremont, Ontario, who had dreams of replicating Pierre de Trois' 1686 expedition to James Bay, drowned in the frigid waters of Lake Temiskaming, about 7 miles or 11 kilometers southeast of the mouth of the Montreal River. There is another cliff overlooking Lake Temiskaming, which is said to have a long association with the mysterious murdwarves of native legend. 
about 11 miles or 18 kilometers northwest of Old Fort Temiskamingue, at the section of the lake closest to Cobalt, is a granite escarpment known as Devil's Rock, or Manadu Ajabikong in Ojibwe. Over the years, Devil's Rock has borne witness to several uncanny events befitting its sinister appellation. Just east of the cliff, in the middle of the lake, is a piece of land called Burnt Island, or Eel Man, where two five-year-old children were lost for five days in the wilderness, in the same week of the same month, exactly 25 years apart from each other. The first of the children to disappear, namely little Grace Cooper, who wandered away from her family's campground in August 1913, declared after her rescue that she had set out to find Devil's Rock. Predictably, this demonic-sounding landmark attracted the interest of English occultist Alistair Crowley, who suspected that it might be imbued with dark, otherworldly power. In 1929, he is said to have climbed the granite face with the aim of finding Ojibwe pictographs, which he believed to be markers denoting a connection with the underworld. In the process, the occultist purportedly lost a chalk stone, a piece of climbing equipment, in a fissure in a rocky appendage, ironically known as the Finger of God. There are several stories which purport to explain the origin of Devil Rock's diabolical name. According to the tale apparently favored by the North Bay Nugget, a newspaper servicing the southerly city of North Bay, Ontario, the cliff's naming was connected in some way to an old legend, in which an Indian princess leapt to her death from the Promontory's Heights after being denied marriage to the brave of her choice. How the Manitou features in this legend, the Nugget has never deigned to explain. In the summer of 1984, Nugget reporter Gord McCullough published an old logger's fable which holds that Devil's Rock is Satan's wife, whose infernal spouse turned her to stone on their honeymoon after he tired of her. A French-Canadian version of this story appears in Joan Finnegan's 1984 book, Laughing All the Way Home. Some say that the rock owes its name to a craggy ledge overlooking the lake, which, like New Hampshire's more famous Old Man in the Mountain, resembles the face of an elderly gentleman in side profile gazing out over the water. And according to Backroads Bill Steer, a professor at Nipissing University and founder of the Canadian Ecology Centre, the rock was named after the Mamakwesiowak, or rock demons, almost certainly a variant of the legendary Mamagwe, whom local natives traditionally believe dwelled in its caves and fissures. As the story goes, Steer wrote in an April 12, 2023 article for the website northontario.travel, the natives surprised the little inhabitants of the many rock crevices, and the raiding party captured one of the gnomes and his knife. As the Ojibwe people withdrew, one of the remaining diminutive spirits retreated inside a deep crevice and created such fearsome noises that his captors threw back the stolen knife towards the opening of the crevice they believed was the entry to the underworld. On April 20th, 1979, an article appeared in the North Bay Nugget alleging that Lake Temiskaming is home to another sort of monster, a huge creature that lurked beneath the surface. The components of the Tri-Town area to which the article refers were the northern Ontario towns of New Liskeard, Haleybury, and Diamond, which were amalgamated in 2004 into the town of Temiskaming Shores. There are rumors circulating throughout the Tri-Town area, the article began, that a creature similar to the one inhabiting Loch Ness in Scotland is living in Lake Temiskaming. The article goes on to explain that this incredible notion was brought to the attention of local journalists by New Liskeard's mayor, Jack Dent, who claimed to have originally heard the story from a native elder from the Wabi River, which drains into the lake's northwestern end. The old Indian claimed that the creature was supposed to be as long as four men, arranged from head to foot, but had never been seen in its entirety. The legend was later borne out by tales of fishermen getting fish finder readings of a hulking object moving slowly beneath their boats. The mayor claimed that most sightings of the creature had been made in a deep channel near Burnt Island, and also near Devil's Rock, where the water is reported to be more than 700 feet deep. Another popular haunt was supposed to be a stretch of water off the town of Ville Marie, not far from the old fort to Miskamingue. Dent took it upon himself to dub the creature Mugwump, an old Algonquian word which means Great One. The piece in the North Bay Nugget touched off a series of newspaper articles throughout northern Ontario many containing the new report of an old sighting, made months, years, or even decades prior, which had presumably been kept private for reasons of social self-preservation. 
Researcher Craig Heinzelman diligently collected these reports and referenced them in his article for the January 2007 issue of the Biofortian Review. Perhaps the oldest encounters with the Mugwump, which did not make it into newsprint, are the strange experiences purportedly had by HPC voyageurs. In his 2002 book, Deep Waters, author James Raffin notes that Lake Temiskaming is bisected by a geological fault line, which runs down the length of the Ottawa River. He proposes that the seismic rumblings, which this fracture occasionally produced, gave voyageurs cause for worry, adding a certain mystery to the already numinous and at times forbidding character of the lake. There are also stories, Raffin continued, of mysterious bumpings on the bottom of canoes during the hourly pipes, when voyageurs would rest on Lake Temiskaming. Some thought these might have been hermetic drumfish that would congregate in the shadows of the canoes, following them surreptitiously from north to south and back again, piscine agents of the mysterious lake sprites. Others ascribed more sinister origins to the sound. The oldest 20th century mugwump report to make it into the papers was provided by an elderly woman named Kate Ardtree, who gave her testimony to journalist Alice Peeper in early 1982. Although Ardtree was the resident of a local nursing home at the time, she had spent most of her life living in a cottage at the edge of Lake Temiskaming, where her father used to tell her tales of the monster that lurked beneath. The creature was said to resemble a massive sturgeon, with a body the length of two canoes, and with a strange-looking head. In the old days, it would sometimes surface along with air bubbles that escaped from underwater fissures. Its lair was believed to lie off Dawson's Point, the peninsula which furrows the lake's northern shore. One day, when she was a girl, perhaps in the 1910s or 20s, Ardtree claimed that her father came home with one of the creature's scales, which was as large as a tea saucer. The elderly woman admitted that she had never seen the monster herself, and was glad that she hadn't. The next oldest mugwump story comes from John Cobb, a then 83-year-old former tugboat captain who had worked atop Lake Temiskaming for nearly 50 years, who told his tale to reporter Darian Rowe in August 1995. In the early 1940s, when he was a lowly deckhand, Cobb routinely helped pull timber rafts from the Blanche River at the lake's northernmost tip to the Narrows just south of Ville Marie. One night while on duty, he came on the deck of the steam-powered Lady Minto just in time to see a 20-foot-long creature resting just beneath the water's surface. He recalled that the strange swimmer had a rounded head and a nose like a land animal. I didn't know what it was, he told Roe. When we come up close, it disappeared. The Mugwump was reportedly seen again in the early 1960s by one Chuck Cool, who gave his story to journalist Mike Pearson in 1979. Cool's sighting allegedly took place while he and his father were returning home from a boating excursion to Burnt Island, just east of Devil's Rock. Although Craig Heinzelman, in his summary of Pearson's elusive article, did not specify the location of Cool's home, the destination of their excursion, and their Scottish, or more precisely non-French surname, hint that the father and son probably lived in Haleybury or New Liskeard, Ontario, placing their sighting at the northwestern end of the lake. We were cruising around in the boat, about a third of the way back from Burnt Island, Cool said, when we saw what looked like a deadhead. We pulled up to it. It rolled over and swam away. It was the biggest sturgeon you've ever seen. I'd been hearing about the thing all my life. Upon further prompting, Cool estimated the fish to be about eight feet long. More than a decade later, in 1978, the monster of Lake Temiskaming surfaced again, this time within view of the bygone Matabenic Hotel in Haleybury, Ontario, on the lake's northwestern shore. While seated in the hotel dining room, guests Ernie Chartrand and his wife spotted something large in the water, moving towards the shore at a blistering pace. As it was nearing the water's edge, the creature did an abrupt about-face, revealing a large humped back without a fin. The maneuver also afforded the couple a clear view of the creature's length, which they estimated to be about 15 feet. In February 1982, Cobalt residents Roger Lapointe 
and retired RCMP officer Dan Arney allegedly came face to face with a mugwump while doing some nighttime ice fishing on Lake Temiskaming. According to an article written by the aforementioned Alice Paper, LaPointe and Arney were hunkered down in one of their friend's ice shanties when some huge fish below took both pieces of bait and sheared both of their lines. Baffled, the anglers reset their lines, cracked some beers, and waited for the next bite. About half an hour later, they were rewarded for their efforts by a tremendous jerk, which wrested both of their fishing rods from their holds and pulled them down the ice hole, where they vanished into the black water. Disgusted by their misfortune, the pair prepared to pack it in for the night, when a peculiar sensation overcame Arnie, a sensation that had served him well in the force. The former Mountie knew that something, or someone, was watching him. He reached out, Peeper wrote, and put a silencing grip on his partner's arm, and they began to survey the half-dark interior of the hut. Looking down, they saw two protruding eyeballs peering up at them from a glistening black head, which had forced itself up through the ice hole. The men beat a hasty retreat to their snowmobile and raced for the safety of the shore. The last and most incredible Mugwump report brought to public attention appeared in the same article as the previous story. At the end of the piece, Alice Peeper included the account of John Shure of New Liskeard, another ice fisherman, who claimed he heard a crunching sound one night while locking up his shanty. Knowing that he was the only fisherman still out on the lake, Peeper wrote, he decided to see what it was about. Thinking it was probably a dog, he almost walked into a long, dark animal that seemed to be wrapped about several of the huts and was chewing something. Shore stated that the creature looked something like a dinosaur, but disclaimed that he did not stay for a second look, instantly fleeing on his snowmobile. Desperate to find someone who might verify his sighting, he paid a visit to a local hotel and secured the assistance of two men, who accompanied him back to the ice. The only evidence of the creature the newcomers managed to find was a snake-like trail in the snow. In late February 1982, Mary Peeper published a disappointing article, which appears to be nothing less than the tipping of her hand, a cheeky admonition that her earlier pieces on the Mugwump, which included the testimonies of John Shure, Roger LaPointe and Dan Arney, and Kate Ardtree, might have been made of more fable than fact. In his article for the Biofortian Review, Craig Heinzelman identified Mary Peeper as one of several pseudonyms used by Ada Arney, a cobalt-based author and journalist, whom readers may observe shares a surname with one of the aforementioned ice fishermen. Another nom de plume she affected was the, apparently, Spanish-German-Scottish Dr. Pablo von McDonnell, a multicultural chimera so outlandish that it must have been crafted for comedic purposes. In an article attributed to Dr. Von McDonnell, published in the February 24, 1982 issue of the Temiskaming Speaker, three alleged experts voiced their opinion on the identity of the monster of Lake Temiskaming. The first of these scholars was Dr. Boris Ilyich Rubikon Skuberinov, a professor of psychobiology at the fictional Karl Marx College in the fictional town of Bolshevik in the fictional country of Russi. He argued that the monster of Lake Temiskaming was probably a beluga sturgeon, whose ancestors were imported as caviar to Russian ports in Alaska, and somehow made their way inland. Another expert was Dr. Johannes Liebig von Brusthalter, a professor of macrobiology at the Max Planck Institute in the fictional city of Esseldorf, West Germany. Finally, there was I. Haggis Campbell, the director of the Institute for Psychic Studies near Edinburgh, Scotland, who opined that the Mugwump is a specimen of Loch Ness Monster, whose ancestors were brought from Scotland to Canada as microscopic eggs. There is a Scottish tradition that endured throughout the Highland Clearances, Campbell explained, in which emigres taking leave of Old Caledonia would bring a sample of their native soil with them to their new country. Some of the earth brought by Scottish immigrants to the Lake Temiskaming region, Campbell reasoned, was from Loch Ness, and contained the microscopic eggs of Loch Ness monsters. Dr. Vaughn MacDonald concluded his piece by revealing that his real name was, in fact, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelty an obvious nod to the author of the 1818 novel Frankenstein, and claiming that he was a scientist in residence at the famed Inch Block in Cobalt, Ontario, the Inch Block being a historic Cobalt multi-purpose building. The same paper contained an article by Ada Arney, this one published under her pseudonym Mary Peeper, in which she claimed to be in correspondence with an anonymous biologist gracious enough to comment upon the monster of Lake Temiskaming. 
This nameless expert proposed that the Mugwump might be a huge ancient salamander called Ichthyostega. In a later article, published on the March 3, 1982 issue of the Temiskaming Speaker, this same biologist proposed another possible identity for the lake monster, namely a long-extinct plesiosaur called Elasmosaurus, which sported a long neck, flippers, and a fish-like tail. Although Ada Arney's last two articles on the Mugwump diminished the credibility of her work on the topic, the accounts of Ernie and Mrs. Chartrand, who spotted something unusual from Haleybury's Matabenic Hotel, Chuck Cool and his father, who came upon a huge sturgeon near Devil's Rock, and respected tugboat captain John Cobb, who saw a 20-foot-long fish with a bestial head in the 1940s, have no such stains on their character. Taken together, these sightings suggest that there may really be an unusual animal living in Lake Temiskaming, which they paint the picture of being an unusual-looking fish with a length of 8 to 20 feet. Most of those who have commented upon the creature, including some of the witnesses, have likened the mugwump to a sturgeon. In spite of this easy solution, it must be remembered that the largest lake sturgeon ever recorded, lake sturgeon or white sturgeon, being the only freshwater varieties of that species known to live in Canadian waters, was a 15-foot, 4-inch long monster hauled from Manitoba's Rousseau River, a far cry from Captain Cobb's 20-foot long behemoth. If the mugwump, or tessie as it is sometimes called today, is indeed a lake sturgeon, it appears to be the largest of its species by a wide margin. A potential explanation for this discrepancy, provided by an anonymous local fisherman, appears in a bygone French-language internet article, which serves as the introduction to a subchapter from Canadian author Joel Champetier's 1994 horror novel, Le Memoir du Lac. It comes around every year in July or early August, the article claims, referring to the mugwump. The hypothesis, these two months correspond to spawning time. According to a former commercial fisherman in the region, it is a lake sturgeon. According to him, people generally see it on calm, sunny days. As calm water has the physical property of doubling objects, the illusion would be complete. Witnesses would therefore see the fish twice its real size. The go-to reference books for unusual and mysterious lake monsters, namely George M. Eberhardt's 2010 tome, Mysterious Creatures, A Guide to Cryptozoology, and Lauren Coleman and Patrick Weig's 2003 classic, The Field Guide to Lake Monsters, Sea Serpents, and Other Mystery Denizens of the Deep, have surprisingly little to say on the monster of Lake Temiskaming, simply listing the creature as a lake monster supposed to reside in Ontario, Canada. Indigenous folklore is less silent on the matter, having at least one traditional story about an enormous fish which dwelled in a lake in northern Ontario. It is perhaps fitting that we end our piece with this oldest of Mugwump stories, a humorous tale which was told around northern campfires long before the Chevalier des Trois first dipped his paddle into Lake Temiskaming. In his 1995 book, Sacred Legends, Canadian folklorist James R. Stevens included an O.G. Cree story told to him by elders of the Sandy Lake First Nation in northwestern Ontario about a huge fish encountered by Jacobache, a legendary Ojibwe hero and trickster figure. According to this brief fable, Jacobache and his sister once lived beside a lake that was home to a huge fish. Contrary to the advice of his sister, who feared this freshwater leviathan, Jacobache tested a batch of new arrows he made by shooting them out over the lake. When he swam to retrieve them, the giant fish swallowed him in one gulp. Jacobache's sister, unaware of what had befallen her younger brother, and supposing that he had gone off on another of his adventures, busied herself with catching fish. As fate would have it, she managed to catch the monster of which she had long been afraid, which seemed even a little bigger than usual. She took the fish home, Stephen's informant told him, and cut open their bellies to put them in the cook pot. When she cut open the belly of the big fish, Jacobace jumped out, very much alive. At first the sister was frightened, and then she started to laugh at the dirty Jacobace. He was covered with fish entrails. I told you, I told you, she laughed. But Jacobache said nothing, and walked to the water's edge to clean himself. I am very pleased to announce that my new book, Mysteries of Canada Volume 4, is now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook format. This book is filled with traditional Canadian folktales, 
which have been presented on this channel in video format throughout 2022 and 2023. The subjects it treats with include the Sasquatch, the Wendigo, the Ogopogo, the Thunderbird, and Legends of Prince Edward Island. To get yourself or a friend or family member a copy of this book, please check out the link in the description.